another day number 6 day for element number 6 of uh, igc training and uh, overall second element of ig2 because we have two units of igc so one is ig1 and second one is ig2 so ig2 is all about uh, uh, a great help to understand to complete our risk assessment projects especially to recognize hazards and evaluate certain kind of risk associated with the hazards and uh, today our topic is uh, muscular skeletal health which is uh, become so much important because now we have more like uh, you know in offices uh, in our uh, you know especially uh, designing our layout for our employees to work manually at our site or especially within manufacturing industries even just became so much important how we going to design your working platforms so people will not face any muscle cramp issues or any kind of uh, uh, backbone issues or even you know any issue with their blood circulations at certain level and most importantly uh, we the mostly working in the office uh, environment how we going to design our work platform so we will not face any sort of issues while typing all the time or uh, looking at the screen and you know not affecting our eyes or not creating any issues to our muscles even that's why this uh, topic is becoming more and more important nowadays especially because of this covid 19 as well <clears throat> so Uh, we have uh, a few learning objectives uh, that means uh, work processes and practices that may rise work related upper limb disorders that is our key point to understand and appropriate control measures and the second objective is uh, again we going to uh, describe the hazards and control measures which should be considered with assessing risk for manual handling activities as i mentioned earlier and the third objective is whatever loading or load handling equipment we are using we have to discuss certain kind of requirements and especially for lifting operations along with their hazards and controls so for uh, let me mention again from element number 5 up to element number 11 is all about hazards and their controls and within that control we talk about elimination uh, you know substitution or engineering controls or you know administrative or ultimately the pps as well but yes uh, for the hazards we also incorporate risk assessment to understand or to evaluate properly the hazards so and their impacts also how horrible they they can be you know for our company operations either for the people for the company assets even for the environment as well as overall for business you know so that's why these three objectives are there especially from element number 5 to 11 is all about hazards and their controls so let's talk about 6.1 is all about uh, we are uld that means work related upper limb disorders so there are uh, four important points to understand about this uh, work related upper limb disorders and the first category we call it msds that mean muscle skeletal disorders a collection of injuries to the skeletal system and the soft tissues associated with the system and second thing is the back injuries and back pain that is why it is mentioned you know you work you sit and you work for 45 minutes and then you take a few minutes to for just like a break and some people even you know uh, going for xerox copy or having some chit chat or uh, you know i would say the live meeting with anyone else so they just find a reason to leave the office chair and move on and just walk for a little bit and uh, this is another kind of break you know but somehow sitting long hours of course it will create some back injuries and back pain 
And uh, let me mention again, because of this COVID-19, mostly digitalization, uh, mostly people are attached with laptops or mobiles and sitting in office and seat work is so much now. So in that scenario, we have to be more careful, you know, especially for back muscle strains or, you know, I would say ligament damage and disc injury also. Now, work-related upper limb disorders were ruled as also carpal tunnel syndrome and tenosynovitis. So we have to be very much careful, you know, uh, for these particular areas. So nobody want to damage himself. And yes, the company should make sure the office rules and uh, the workstations are designed as per international standards. So people are also falling uh, for their safety which is very much important as mentioned earlier also. Other chronic soft tissue injuries associated with sitting, standing or kneeling for long periods of time at work. So some of the chronic soft tissue injuries could also happen, but these are associated with sitting, standing or kneeling for long periods of time at work. Now, what are the high risk activities or repetitive uh, operations? So we call it uh, number one, like, you know, which involves significant risk like DSC, that means display screen equipment or DSC use, keyboard operations, especially the typist or, you know, the office clerics or even uh, we, the managers are also sometimes typing a lot of things like uh, policies, procedure, uh, procedures or different kind of circulars or or preparing some format. So a lot of uh, typing we also do. Factory assembly of small components, supermarket checkout operations and brick laying. So any repetitive activity and uh, with same speed or with the same expectation from the management, some people are bound to do it. Like if, uh, if someone has gave us a typing project, or you have to type these uh, 100 pages and it's time bound, like you have to do it within five hours. Now, if we are doing it within five hours, that means a lot of speed we have to follow, even though we are expert as a typist, but still the threats could be on our muscles and a lot of, uh, you know, issues to our arms, to our fingers even, there is a possibility. That's why we have to understand the disorder risk factors of uh, muscle skeletal that means uh, three domains to understand one is the task factors any task which is uh, repeating over and over and required a particular force and posture twisting a rest all comes under task factors equipment factor is all about uh, design adjustability imagine if your office table or your chair is not uh, designed in a way that you can be comfortable for sitting six hours or eight hours, of course, it will create a lot of issues. Same way the environment factors like lighting, glare, other factors, temperature. I mean, if lighting is uh, less than 500 lux or even at least uh, three to 400 lux, still will not feel comfortable. And same way, if someone is uh, working in quality inspection department and all the time he is inspecting different uh, tools or equipment or items or components, he required uh, a sufficient light, maybe more than 500 lux. So less than that, he will definitely affecting his eyes and most importantly will not be feeling comfortable in that particular environment. So these three factors, like task factors, equipment factors, and environment factors, all comes under, you know, uh, musculoskeletal disorder risk factors. So whenever we gonna do risk assessment of DSC or, or you know, the relevant to any kind of task our employees are performing, or any sort of equipment we are using for lifting, for movement, for you know, several, like let's take an example of forklift or even hand trolleys or, you know, which we use for internal transporting of different materials. And for this reason, design adjustability has also become important relevant to equipment. Same way, 
lighting glare other factors that means the environmental factor must also be considered so this is the most important slide of this element number six if we can understand uh, this triangle automatically we can do better risk assessment and of course we'll put a lot of controls by following a variety of control as per international standards of, as well here. now matching the workplace to individual needs our heights are different you know our body shape sometime you know someone is uh, having 100 kg or above and someone is just 60 kg something like that so a lot of factors you know that's why the ergonomics is concerned with the interaction between people and the tools and equipment or machinery that they are using so whatever our employees are using we we surely have to match the workplace according to their needs you know and the same way the workplace environment and organizational factors also critical to understand now a typical example uh, is dsc the display screen equipment imagine if you you know this uh, laptop the way it is kept look at the picture he's just bending his neck and even i would say the back as well or the shoulder at least and uh, keeping this uh, kind of posture for two three hours or even i would say for 45 minutes some level he will start feeling a little bit uh, muscle stretch or maybe pain as well that's why the risk of rules and back pain or eye strains or fatigue and stress as well and imagine if that laptop is right in front of his eyes and uh, the keyboard is also in level of his uh, elbow and hands he'll, he'll be more comfortable instead of uh, looking down and putting pressure on back or uh, even uh, more stress on the eyes because might be the screen is so near as well now what are the control measures, uh, measures? Uh, again uh, whichever area we want to improve risk assessment is the basic tool i repeat again whichever area we want to improve within our company operations risk assessment is the first tool same way if you want to control dsc relevant issues or kind of risk and hazards the first thing is the workstation assessment and then provide basic dsc workstation equipment to minimum standards yes we have to plan the work routine and provide free eyesight tests and spectacles if required and no harm to provide proper information and training on risk, preventive measures, ergonomic use of the workstations. You know, all these things looks very similar and lighter because every day we are working maybe for the last uh, uh, 10 years, 15 years or 20 years. And we're gonna feel, oh, it's not a problem because it's quite, uh, we are used to. But a time will come, you will start feeling some uh, terrible changes within your body within your muscles and might be the weakness in muscles might be the weakness is bonds also because of your uh, uh, poor practices while working and ignoring all dsc relevant uh, best practices you know take an example the control measures look at the back first number one that means our backbone must be straight enough. And most importantly, uh, I hope you remember I asked, do you review the POs like purchase order or purchase requisitions? Like if I'm working in uh, safety department and i requested you please uh, change my chair i i need a new chair because existing chair is uncomfortable i'm uncomfortable on existing chair so can you buy a new chair for me now if you don't give them the specs or the design features of that chair or the design features of a safest chair as per international standards 
again you know you will be uncomfortable even buying a new chair that is why it is always requested whatever purchase requisition or purchase order or you are buying going to buy anything i would say within your company better to review the specs or kind of design features from quality and safety department otherwise the procurement department must be fully familiar about all the international regulations standards codes you know kind of european standards or american standards or you know so they can buy the safer chair for us and if they ignore that part and immediately they just buy whatever they understand or oh, is office chair so any office chair will work then it wouldn't be acceptable because again uncomfortability you will be facing god forbid so that is that is why i always encouraging to the companies whenever you are going to buy anything it could be a crane it could be a forklift it could be office chair tables even laptops and everything let the safety and quality department endorse and you know acknowledge and accept or at least propose or suggest or give recommendations for international standards uh, specs and design features because mostly we have uh, understanding oh once we we will buy a chair from a brand it would be okay na yes it would be okay especially for the people who don't understand what are the dsc standards or best practices and uh, might be this chair is not designed accordingly so i hope uh, it would have given you an idea why you know all these factors are important now look at number 3 that mean the chair must be adjustable like we normally have it and sometime uh, they are just defaulted and uh, no more maintenance because and we don't want to throw that chair now what we are doing we are compromising because i noted i am sharing personal you know even in the meeting uh, halls or kind of meeting rooms i noted several chairs i mean their adjustment going up and down or that kind of adjustments not working and nobody is uh, bothering about it you know look at the number 4 that is all about relevant to you how you going to sit and uh, bend your leg and keeping the right angle and look at the number 5 as well which normally we we think this is this facility is only for the ladies no 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 this facility even for the males you know not only for the female only yes for female is looking or you know we observe is more important but for the male as well especially those uh, especially for those who are working for like 6 hour 8 hours is all about seat work then we have to design their layout or official structure as per dsc best practices or standards you know then their quality and productivity will not be damaged and they'll perform more because if they are happy they are comfortable of course the outcome would be in a greater performance you know if you are feeling uncomfortable how long you can consider and sit every day you know that's not that's not the way we should design our dsc now number 6 i hope uh, the pictures are giving you insights how you have to bend up and most importantly look at number 7 and the height of the elbow and the and the more easier part of the keyboard and look at uh, the design of the keyboard at number 8 because everything is reciprocal if number 8 is not good number 7 would be affected now look at number 9 that mean the eye contact between the screen and your eye that means your eye contact with the screen is also critically important i would say and mostly ignored 
I mean, you go back and see, just take this picture, take a printout and verify how people are sitting, how they are like, you know, bending their legs and look at the design of the chair. I'm sure uh, you guys are amazing, Mashala. You are a big brand and I, I'm sure you are a role model for everything. But still, I would suggest go back and see either might be the table, chair, everything you purchase as per international standards, but look at the behavior of uh, your team members or your colleagues, you know, while using chair or working at the table along with the computer or laptops. So all, uh, and even number 10, the table itself, So these 10 points, you can benchmark and even can use it for your risk assessment, you know. I mean, this picture you can benchmark even for your risk assessment of all the office stations. So all one to 10 points, you can double check, verify and see if they're okay enough. Otherwise, you can suggest some controls, put some precautions or kind of rules and regulations and enforce them also, you know, because sometimes people are reluctant to follow, even, you know, giving any importance to the backbone. They are bending their backbone and later on they started feeling, you know, back pain or kind of uh, other issues actually. Now, <clears throat> some of the additional points, uh, the desk layout, the document holder, you know, some additional things, workplace lighting and telephone headset. So make sure you have some specific measures for laptop, like short duration work on docking station, brakes and eye test. Now, like you mentioned, you have, mashallah, uh, the medical, you know, annual medical screening of all the employees. So I hope this eye test is also included into it. Now, DSE control measures for, uh, again, the same phenomena, like uh, the workstation assessment must be done. Provide basic DSE workstation equipment to minimum standards and plan to work routine. Provide free, I said, tests and spectacles if required. Provide information and training or risk and preventive measures like ergonomic use of the workstation as well. So that is all about uh, end of module 6.1. So few of the exercises, like what factors increase the risk of uh, musculoskeletal injuries and what health effects can arise due to the use of DSC, what control measure should be implemented to reduce the DSC injuries. And this is all we studied in the presentation. So let's talk about our most neglected, I would say the topic, the manual handling. Here, before I discuss anything about Nibosh theories, why can't we, uh, you know, discuss something uh, more important, like, especially for male and female, what is the minimum weight they can lift? Imagine if you have somebody like uh, picking up the boxes and putting on the pallet and for eight hours or 12 hours, have a same regular job. That means the manual handling is there. And how much the weight should be of that box actually, especially for male and then for female. What is your understanding? What should be the weight of that box? They are every day is a routine work. Someone is taking that box and putting on the pallet. And then going on maybe with four layers. And the box height is, uh, let's take an example of, uh, uh, you know, one and a half feet. And the width is also one and a half feet. So it's a square box. Now, what do you think, what should be the weight of that box so they can easily, you know, work for eight hours and it shouldn't be so dangerous for them? because it's a regular routine activity. 
So if the box is more in weight, more chances of muscle cramp and issues and you know, they'll be more uncomfortable. So do you have any idea what should be the maximum or minimum weight for male and female to lift every day? I'm opening this question in the chat box. Minimum weight lift for male as of manual handling. And you know, in the warehouse, normally we have uh, like for single, single boxes, we tell people to lift and put on the racks. And we have male employees, we have female employees. So what criteria we have to follow, you know, the allowed weight for male to be lifted and even for female as well. You can give reference from OSHA, from ILO, for, from HSC UK or any standard from your, or within your company, like you have a procedure for manual handling. So what weight you have defined for male and for female, especially if uh, there is any Excellent, Mr. Muhammad al Gamdi. Excellent, mashallah. I was expecting the same answer. Brilliant. Now, only one point. This is mentioned in which standard? Like, can we find that standard? Or, yeah, like you took it from OSHA, from ILO, from WHO, from, uh, you know, Ministry of Health of Saudi Arabia, or, or any other regulatory body. Or from Sasso, from OSHA. Excellent, Marshall. Excellent. So this is, uh, that means above then 25 itself is a risk for them. And above then six hours or eight hours every day, the duty hours, what we have given them, if we violate those hours also, like putting more extra hours, Again, the same weight would also be dangerous, you know. And also one more factor, how speedy they are, even though they are lifting 25 kg, but what is the speed? Like if conveyor belt is there, let's take an example, and boxes are coming and coming, and you know, we have uh, in front few people and they're lifting the boxes and putting on the pallets, and it's a very speedy activity. So shall we allow the same weight or to impose and enforce the same way to work or, or what rules are we going to follow here? Because speed is a very dangerous factor. You know, if more speedy boxes are coming from the conveyor and people are responsible, if they will not lift, the box will fall down and uh, it's a property damage and nobody wants it. You know, that's why the, the employees are under great stress sometimes. And are we going to follow the same weight, like 25 kg for male and 16 kg for female? Okay, let me share uh, one of the you know, the practical example while we signed the consulting project and that was uh, IMS, you know, we call it Integrated Management System. And one of the challenge was that particular, like how we're gonna standardize the manual handling. And the box weight was more than 25 kg. 
and the male employees are responsible to take this box and putting on the pallet and up to the four layer they have to wrap up and then move this uh, pallet to the uh, warehouse or uh, uh, to another dispatch area and while we were evaluating and performing risk assessment we evaluated that weight is not as per the international standards so it's not acceptable i don't want to quote the name of the brand but that brand you know was the biggest culprit you know how if the box is uh, suppose 30 kg like 5 kg extra as per like even though violating the international standards now 40 kg weight someone is lifting surely damaging his muscles and his health for sure you know but why that brand imposed that one because a lot of saving in custom taxes a lot of saving in packaging materials i mean making more boxes mean more weight i don't know either you got this point or not more bigger box that means less will be the cost of packaging for that brand not for the company for that brand because that brand have given a very calculated uh, cost sheet and according accordingly some net profit or kind of gross profit to the company it was a very well calculated so they imposed to the company okay forget about the standard just we need 30 kg box instead of 25 and they simply damn care how the employees would be like because whenever i talk to them they are facing horrible issues especially after eight hours going back to home and you know while sleeping then they started feeling a terrible time you know it's not easy for them even to sleep because the muscle pain is there muscle stretching is there a lot of issues and then we talk to that brand how come you can you are a global brand so how come you can violate these kind of standards you know and the moment uh, they shared the stories it was millions of dollars saving because they were uh, delivering this material to more than 150 countries so this is how you know by saving money that is why i always say oh now the new religion invented gain money and power by any means who cares you are in trouble and lifting 30 kg every day you know anyhow uh, to be very honest even even as a consultant we we couldn't bring any change and only one change we brought who are whoever is having some healthy body and you know a joint gym and is fit to that so please uh, replace these guys with them and give some lighter jobs to the existing one you know so the only that change we brought in because the top management didn't agree we had some brand meetings with the concerned customer even they didn't agree because a lot of saving was involved and less weight of the packaging because instead of using more boxes that means more weight and at the custom border you know the tax is charged weight wise or per kg you know so they were saving a lot of tax also one way less packaging second way saving a way to save the tax at the border and one more benefit less you know more saving of space within their warehouses also and to be very honest you know uh, i'm very honestly straightforwardly talking to you i was i was just uh, speechless that as a consultant as a trainer <laughs> uh, how we have to convince them we have no other choice you know if we and we were also commercially bound because if we uh, take some straight forward decisions we will lose a contract and one contract losing means so we also faced a lot of pressure from our management side 
even i shared these those stories with our top management and the owner of our company he mentioned is that if they are not agreeing so please uh, find some win win situation solution you know so i found okay at least change the workers put some who every day have some uh, you know strong exercise and they are having healthy body so then replace them with them otherwise what else we can do if you guys have millions of dollars saving and well calculated so sometimes these are the you know genuine challenges and uh, you can't do anything even you are a safety manager or you are a quality director whatever position you have sometimes it's hard because commercialization or money is a lot of money is involved they don't want to lose that money you know. i hope you got the point and the issue was manual handling and we consider it's a very simple subject it's not a simple subject i mean you you just go back and see how many manual activities are going on into your workshops in any way where people are lifting some weight and see if you are not providing them some mechanical solutions or some robotic technologies or or some hand trolleys then see every day what is their situation you know and even until today sometimes i feel how come i couldn't convince them <laughs> the top management or to the brand even because they made me speechless look we are saving millions of dollars so why should we consider your suggestions we can't change the packaging because i suggested them please reduce the packaging and you know reduce the weight i mean let's just pack 25 kg maximum don't kill the people and trust me nobody agreed because i i'm honestly speaking with you because even though i felt oh i can deal to the board members i can convince them i have a very uh, confident communication style so and i'll give a lot of logics behind a lot of reference for international standards like osha is saying our minister of health is saying but they don't bother they didn't bother at all <laughs> but who is the real victim the affected ones the employees so the guys these are genuine challenges and be ready for that and i don't know how you going to convince in such uh, matters you know now manual handling the lifting carrying pushing and pulling of a load by bodily force that is called manual handling now we can have a group discussion here what common injuries occur when carrying out a manual handling task i'm opening this discussion in the chat box what common injuries occur when carrying out a manual handling task common injuries and manual handling please uh, the question is open for your and looking for your reply on it or any kind of comments common injuries and manual handling any task it can be any task so let's have some common injuries what can happen you know uh, yeah mr you so much better if we will like uh, take it as a workplace you know instead of because at home we are more careless <laughs> at home we are doing a lot of like non routine activities or lifting here and there and moving things and but normally we 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 take it uh, very lightly you know but at workplace at least something must be serious yes mr mohammed al gamdi mashala the sprain strains back injuries soft tissue injuries or wrist arms shoulders neck or legs hernia or chronic pain excellent mashala so let's see what nibosh is talking about 
The common types of manual handling injury is same like Mr. Muhammad al Gamdi mentioned the back injury, the tendon and ligament injuries or muscle injuries, harness or even, you know, rules or cuts, bone dislocation or broken bones as well. Uh, let me share with you, last night, I was uh, in the fitness club, it's kind of a gym club, and one of my, you know, actually we, we do exercise together. So he was uh, lifting the weight and his shoulder suddenly, you know, slipped off the disc and the bone. And he immediately threw the weight and then he did like this, you know, like this, because his shoulder was just what I, you know, the bones were slipped off actually. So immediately he, because he was very much, uh, I would say, the smart mind holder, and he immediately did like this. And later on, he mentioned, you know, Ishtiag, what happened? My shoulder was out of the way. So that's why I did like this, and it's back on the same place. If I could be delayed, and some of this skin or kind of the muscle from uh, inside going to go inside between the two bones, then it would be terrible. So, you know, sometimes you never know how things can go against you. So make sure you understand clearly the common type of hazards associated with manual handling. Look at some of the examples, good handling techniques. Before lifting, check the load. Instead of immediately trying to lift, check the load. Plan the route of the carry and establish a firm grip. Okay, let me mention every process in the world have three stages before, during, and after. Before, during, and after. So this is how before lifting, these are the three steps you have to bring in your mind, like check the load, plan the route of the carry, and establish a uh, firm grip or, or a tight grip. Then the second is the lift itself. Bend the knees and use the leg muscles to lift. Look at the example. Keep the back upright and keep the load close to the body and avoid twisting, overreaching or jerking even. That means during the lift or during lifting process, this is what you have to follow. And setting down, use the same principle as lifting, maintain good balance, set the load down and then adjust its position using body weight. Now, the same thing we can display, and I'm sure you guys could have displayed, you know, in several areas, what are the good, uh, uh, you know, handling techniques, actually. So if you are uh, in a kind of assessor for manual handling risk, or you are doing risk assessment of manual handling, remember these four important words or kind of factors, you know. The first is the task, individual, load, and environment. So we have to value tile. Tile means the task, individual, load, and environment. And if you get anything, you know, even you can mention in your risk assessment project because mostly uh, the moment you will take uh, a risk assessment of your company processes, you will not ignore manual handling. And within that uh, risk assessment project, you can mention some of the controls, you know, how you're going to control the task, how, what individual have to do, what kind of rules they have to follow, how the load should be looked like and evaluated and lift, and same way, what controls we require for the environment. So let's understand one by one why these four main factors are important, especially in manual handling, you know, while performing especially the risk assessment. Now, uh, even though it's a kind of open exercise, identify the specific factors that would need to be considered to carry out a manual handling risk assessment. Use the following general factors like cost, individual load, and environment. Now, uh, uh, let me just share one by one 
because since it's a quite general topic, but the task is all about the height of the load, where you are going to place the load. Is it a repetitive task or kind of a repetition of task? What is the distance from where you are bringing that box and putting where? What is that distance? You know, how much time you are carrying that load? Stooping, twisting, rest breaks, vertical distance, above shoulder height, and overreaching. All these factors are relevant to the task. Now, individual capabilities, uh, unusual ability required, significant risk to vulnerable people, what could be like, especially for pregnant workers or workers with pre-existing back injuries, must have to be considered. And for the load, weight is important. And there isn't any excuse, oh, the weight was not mentioned, I don't know, what is the weight? If you don't know, ask someone to share what is the load, what is the weight, you know? And of course, you can have an understanding for the size and the bulk, stability, center of gravity is uh, very much important. That means the balance of the load, your grip is critical, and make sure you have a value to it. Is it hot, sharp, or even cold enough? No, the environment. We are discussing time. So the last E is all about environment. That means space restrictions, floor condition, make sure it is not slippery or uneven. Changes and floor levels. Again, the design of your layout and the complete shop floor management and the, the structure of your company, light levels and temperature and humidity. All these factors are relevant to environment. Now, avoiding or minimizing the manual handling risk. Again, hierarchy of control can be followed, but the first is eliminate or otherwise assess. Use handling aids, modify mean task, load, or environment. That means it's redesigning or kind of re engineering. Modify either the task or the load or the environment. And yes, one more thing. I requested that company, okay. Uh, why can't you find some kind of uh, artificial intelligence or robotic technology and, uh, and he can lift in a speedy manner, taking the box, putting on the pallet and making four layers. And later on, the employees or the machine can wrap up, you know, quite immediately. So only they will move the pallet. But now here the cost was involved. Even they didn't agree with that idea. You know. There is a solution for everything. But yes, uh, companies, they are reluctant to invest money. They believe our things are being managed. So why should we invest? Otherwise, there is a solution, especially nowadays, there is a solution for every problem in the world. You know. But yes, some solutions are expensive. Now, avoiding or minimizing the manual handling risk, what we have to do, like I mentioned, automation, mechanization or conveyor systems or forklift trucks or pallet trucks or cranes or hoist. So these are some of the, you know, like techniques to avoid or minimize the manual handling risk. But automation, again, you know, expensive solution, some companies, they really want to optimize their processes. So they'll agree on it because they believe more better productivity, more speedy process, uh, you know, no delays in uh, delivery of items to the customers. That means more better customer satisfaction. So they, they calculate and they go for, they calculate the benefits and they go for automation, you know. They invested money because they calculated genuinely what are the benefits if we if we go with the automation and remove their manual handling activities, you know. Now, avoiding or minimizing the manual handling risk, we can use trolleys, barrel lifts, gene wheels, trucks, or hoist and lift. 
And you will see usually all these things, you know, in the companies, especially for melanin. Now, avoiding or minimizing the manual handling risk, again, four elements, task, load, environment, and individual means make sure the rest breaks or the job rotation is there, especially for the task. Don't let a person working continuously for this particular task. Eliminate stooping or twisting, table lift. The load itself, make sure you have smaller loads, stabilized loads, and uh, Mark center of gravity, attach handles and several workers. The environment, rearrange workspace, level uneven floors, additional lighting. So safety starts from the design. How you are designing your layout, how you are designing the environment. Even the design of the load itself, either in the box, either in shape of tools, equipment, whatever, how you are designing that load and most importantly the individuals you have to match individual capabilities to the activity like you you are minimizing manual handling risk and adding forklift and adding forklift that means another hazard and associated processes could have a lot of uh, risk and hazards you know imagine if the forklift operator is not properly trained or certified. Imagine if he is not uh, working in a safe manner for six, eight hours and small mistake, and there is a property damage. And if you go to YouTube and have an understanding how many incidents are happening just because of forklift operators or forklift itself, you'll be shocked. That means if you are ready, more equipments to remove manual handling, make sure you get the right person for the right job, the competent one, and make sure the human error, he understand how small mistake can destroy everything. Like one of the forklift just hit to the, you know, the rack line number one, and the rest of the all racks fell down because the gravity is uh, disabled or kind of disbalance is there. So everything is fall down. And even that forklift operator was also under the load actually. Because all racks are standing 90 degree. If you will like five to 10 degree, if that racks are unstable, automatically they will fall down and move on because that load is so high. That means the racks quality must also be designed if you are using more forklifts, especially in the warehouses. And a lot of quality required as a forklift operator. Same way, the crane operator, same way a lot of other, you know, even to use hand trolleys. I mean, we need to train them properly how to use that equipment. So let's discuss about load handling equipment. Look at the example, like cage platform trucks are there, pallet trucks or two wheeled platform trucks or sack trucks. And usually you're gonna see these equipment in different, especially you know in supermarkets also, not only within your company only, even in supermarkets or mostly the warehouses or internal process to process transportation of internal materials, you will see these kind of equipment. But more equipment you are adding, that means more hazards are also coming into your company. So how are you going to identify what hazards can be there? If you have manual handling risk, like bodily forces still needed, instability of the load, moving up, down, or across slopes, poor parking, other pedestrian may be struck, trap feet, trap person being handled. So you have to be smart enough. If you are adding an equipment, make sure that equipment quality is good. The person who's going to operate is the competent one. And most importantly, the layout which is designed. Like if the forklift required 10 feet uh, width to move on and you are providing only seven feet. So more possibility to hit to the 
pillars or to the machines or because it's required sufficient place that means the layout of your site is also so much important so what are the controls so make sure you have as i mentioned the trained workers only follow manufacturer recommendations avoid uneven ground and slopes a lot of incident happened especially for the forklift or even to the a different kind of trolleys the reason is uneven grounds or kind of slopes you know use ramps over straps and uh, straps and also safe working loads securing the load use the brakes care when moving or lowering the load and safe parking and storage routine inspection and maintenance is critical safety shoes are boots you know and routine inspection is not like tick 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 only 100% ticks that there is not any problem that routine inspection means with full of focus and it must be done you know by the operator itself and if anything is uh, not working properly he is the one informing to the supervisor or the supervisor to the maintenance department creating work order for them or all such kind of equipment must also have third party inspection you know but third party inspection does not mean just changing the speaker third party inspection means they are inspecting thoroughly in detail and giving you the right picture or kind of uh, the true picture of your equipment you know not hiding anything because sometimes we are also requesting oh just change the sticker we will manage rest of the thing later on and if they compromise and later on something happened then the huge question mark even for the third party inspection companies you know how you what you inspected and how come you can put a sticker just while you didn't do inspection and our cameras our cctvs they are they are a true evidence and then they would also be in trouble no people hoist and handling aids look at one example especially for the patient designed in the hospitals or even at home you know that mean the patient hoist used for moving people can be manual or powered can be mobile or fixed consider the environment that means difficult to push on carpet and regular inspection needed now people hoist and handling aids the small handling aids might be the slide shields and transfer board slide patient from trolley to bed avoid lifting the person and wheelchair can be powered though most are pushed now i'm opening uh, the discussion for all of you what accidents could occur with the use of forklift trucks take your time accidents of forklift trucks or you can mention the root causes also if possible what accidents could occur with the use of forklift truck okay against pedestrian they would be in trouble excellent mr ahmed mashallah anything else
please uh, whatever is your understanding highlight so we can have more deeper discussion because it's quite easy bringing solutions but those solutions could also bring a lot of uh, hazards you know along with like now optimizing our processes we are adding more equipment more technology and you know the more speedy innovation of technology we are not ready sometime to understand their hazards and kind of complications and you know and even putting the right solutions it's not like solving one problem and creating a lot of other problem here Yes, proximity sensor is one of the solutions. Excellent, Marshall. And you know, mostly what I personally, you know, evaluated in several companies, mostly the overturn, you know, they they ignore. Like if forklift is designed for, uh, suppose one ton, so they are trying to lift maybe more than one ton, and sometimes, you know, putting more weight at the back. my might, might be some employees are sitting and they are uh, achieving center of gravity or kind of you know balancing the load which is another terrible phenomena you know because instead of bringing the suitable forklift they are trying to solve their issue within the existing by using the existing forklift you know which is uh, a terrible mistake so overturns is another problem because the most common type of uh, uh, forklift accident what i personally also noted is one of the most fatal is the overturn or being crushed by a forklift also you know because some people you know, uh, especially you know in the uh, a lot of incident you can also evaluate the people are coming in between you know might be in between the forklift and the load itself so they are caught in between the load as well as the structure or might be the racks might be some so we have to put some better controls against all these issues yes engineering control by limiting the speed to the approved speed so effort the driver can not exceed it yes absolutely right and sometimes we want them to be more speedy we have 10 containers to load within 6 hours so mr forklift do it as quick as possible so the more speed means more probability of accident okay blue light to be on while review okay excellent marshall so these are some again design features of the forklift now can i create a question here if you have some understanding you know look at look at the picture these are the forks and if you are lifting a load and moving around what should be the distance from the floor or what should be the distance between the forks and the floor you know the height height of the load from the floor what it should be like the safest height of the load from the floor while you are moving that load especially in like this load is so high the more high more chances of tipping over more chances of so it's not the same capacity if you are same like you know uh, if you are opening more boom of the train the less weight you have to lift it's not like if the crane can lift 200 tons so you will drive 200 tons if you are opening the boom accordingly you can reduce the you have to reduce the weight you know instead of uh, expecting the same and these are the terrible mistakes so we ignore the load chart even you know especially in rigging and lifting same way if you are taking load more upward 
so the same balance or the same gravity wouldn't be there you know the center of gravity and the more chances of the load to be fall down more chances of tipping over more chances of overturn that is why i created this question what should be the safest height from the floor while you are moving around or operating a forklift so please remember uh, it's like uh, 8 inch from the floor somebody going to say 6 to 8 inches but maximum you can consider 8 inch more than that means you are bringing more risk now you can uh, see your forklift operators how they are behaving you know how much height they are putting from the floor either 8 inch or more than that or 1 feet or 2 feet or do they have that idea we, even though we have separate training one day training for forklift operators and we guide them a lot of things you know how they have to be the safest forklift operator and avoiding any sort of incidents you know so all your forklift operator you can ask them you know if they are familiar what is the standard height from the floor while moving around and taking the load you know? so these are some of the hazards of forklift truck like overturn of the truck fall of the load okay and striking pedestrians fall or entrapment of persons riding on forklifts or fall from the loading dock these are some of the hazards of forklift trucks and what are the precautions uh, restricting use only the authorized operators they are allowed to use forklift vehicle inspection before use but again no tick 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 that everything is okay if any issues are there they must highlight in the report also routine maintenance use proper working platform of to people to lift people or secure and stable load safe working load limits not exceeded speed limits and never traveling with the forks raised and never traveling with obstructed vehicle so these are some of the precautions if you are using battery powered trucks these are some of the hazards like explosion from hydrogen gas with charging while charging corrosive acids manual handling arcing shock burns or fire environmental means battery disposal because battery disposal whatever we are using more facilities we get more waste we are generating and how we going to tackle this waste that's another challenge precautions uh, charge batteries in when well ventilated area no ignition sources and use pps when handling acid and mechanized battery handling electrical safety means insulated tools and gloves gloves even though mashallah as per my understanding you have potential a lot of potential as a hsc leader but still no harm to increase our vocabulary because in the exam in the risk assessment project we required more vocabulary or even though it's a open book we can research uh, since we're going to give you this presentation also so you can quite easily search up but you have to type by yourself so more better understanding you have more but a logical answer you can give like if any of the scenario is talking about forklift and the accident or the accident happened because of the forklift then they're going to say oh uh, does the company was following the same kind of precautions or as per international standards they are operating that forklift so this vocabulary will be helping you actually so for, for so what is the right what is the right strategy to train ourselves topic wise instead of uh, you know Uh, overall uh, unit wise or kind of element wise the best strategy is we have to be trained topic wise like forklift trucks is a topic cranes is a topic manual handling is a topic same way if we talk about uh, like fire is a topic same way if we going to talk about kind of you know 
uh, safety policies is a topic. So we have to train ourselves topic wise instead of clause wise, instead of uh, you know unit wise or element wise. Much better is pick the key topics and clear your understanding. And within these topics, the topics you are already more familiar with that, and you are just revising and. Uh, having some refresh uh, understanding that means you'll be more effective inshallah and more easier for you to attempt to complete your risk assessment project more easier for you to uh, you know put the answers against any sort of question that in line with the scenario in ig1 also I, I i shared with all of you in the group the the answers you know how those answers must be look like and i took the example from the you know, this training material and the Nibosh books, you know. And I hope it will give you an insight how your answer should be look like. Now, let's take an example of uh, diesel powered trucks. Even we must not use uh, diesel powered trucks, especially indoor, because whenever petrol or diesel burns, we are creating what? Carbon monoxide. And carbon monoxide above than 35 ppm, if the people are working still without scrub or without respiratory equipment, it's a terrible hazard. It's a great risk. So I repeat again, whenever we burn diesel and petrol, that means more carbon monoxide. That is why the global economy, they are looking for alternatives and that is why as per 20, uh, 2030 vn of saudi arabia they are trying to create a non-oil based economy instead of oil based because previous history 82 years or plus is all about oil based economy of saudi arabia and now as per the vn of 2030 mashallah uh, you guys are going to create non-oil based economy and that non-oil based economy would be much, much better than oil based, even though oil based income would be a bonus income, inshallah, for Saudi Arabia. But but you will be exporting a lot of like manufact local manufacturing will be there. Even you will be the best exporter, like made in Saudi Arabia. Even right now, just make a list how many items you are exporting to other countries. That means you are trying your level best to create a non-oil based economy less imports maximum exports like if you are buying 100 billion dollar items from other countries why can't you create or manufacture within your country so this is another good strategy in line with your 2030 v in mashallah and why non-oil based economy because we we don't want to damage the environment anymore. It's already a red zone. Because more damages to the environment or to the natural resources, more earthquake, more heavy rains, more floods. So the world is seriously thinking to res especially to resolve environmental issues, you know. That is why in Saudi Aramco, even within your company, everywhere you must have at every project one environmental engineer who will be doing environmental aspects and impact study, a lot of environmental studies, putting a lot of controls in place, suggesting a lot of solutions, you know, especially in designing phase of certain equipments and or even to buying them. He'll be suggesting a lot of uh, good thing you know to avoid any terrible you know violations related to environmental standards of saudi arabia and i hope you remember i shared one of the study one of uh, the standard of saudi arabia in the whatsapp group also so remember this diesels or petrol powered trucks should not be used indoor If you will be using indoor, what you are creating more toxic environment. And if it is a food company, or the high hygienic products you are producing, that means you are mixing 
the contamination of uh, carbon monoxide is going into the pro products you know same way we have to evaluate while working on our machines or even tools and equipment whatever we are using all kind of machinery what is going in the air must be evaluated through our environmental engineer or through third party you know because the hazards are terrible like dermatitis from the diesel slip hazard environmental pollution from the large spills toxic exhaust fumes and bulk storage of diesel what is the precautions uh, have a well ventilated areas spill kits use gloves when handling diesel no liquefied petroleum like lpg power trucks there are hazards because this kind of a tickling bomb explosion has a risk from lpg toxic exhaust fumes manual handling storage of lpg cylinders or bulbs precautions use in well ventilated areas uh, mechanized lpg cylinder handling store space cylinders in a secure safe well ventilated location so bringing more equipment that means more associated hazards but since we have safety officials since we have delivered a lot of training to our employees since we have a lot of uh, procedures to operate you know these kind of or manage these kind of uh, of you know equipments or kind of heavy equipments because we are getting more productivity more faster processes are there more better customer satisfaction so we are bound to innovate we are bound to go for such kind of solutions but bringing these solutions man, means we are welcoming more hazards also so if you will ignore the better controls or kind of precautions more terrible consequences and that is happening you know people are very much eager to bring new equipments but sometimes employees are not well trained sometimes the layout knows good enough sometimes they don't understand the precautions sometimes they understand the precautions but nobody is following them and that is the reason we are having a lot of accidents related to heavy equipments like accidents because of crane forklift man lift even excavators you know even bulldozers a lot of equipments we have now let's talk about lifts and hoists you know this is all about that mean the falling objects being stuck by the load and entanglement in moving parts uh excellent marshala mr rahman uh, that's why i call you know you are a role model marshala <laughs> you are leading by example even though the battery operated uh, still you know some hazards but you can easily control them but at least no toxic environment you know very less uh, you know except the dust sometimes if your floors are not uh, properly cleaned or, or dust accumulation is there especially after sandstorm and you are using uh, forklift moving around within the warehouse then the dust is accumulating in the air and same dust we are inhaling you know so this is some kind of uh, and sometimes the battery itself you know uh, people normally what they do is after duty they are charging that means no supervision so several incident happened because of overcharging so i hope you have strong control for all these hazards mashallah and it's good you are using battery operated now lifts and hoists falling objects being struck by the load entanglement in moving parts falls from height and being stuck while riding on the platform by lift landing levels parts of an enclosure or other projections even though these are normal things or hazards you are already controlling i'm sure now these are some of the precautions make sure you have suitable for intended use and most importantly preventing people getting underneath the hoist or the lift platform access to an unprotected landing edge or struck by landings or other obstructions when being carried on the load maximum safe working load you will you will not violating 
SWL of that equipment and safety devices like brakes and working. Competent operators are there. Information instructional training is well given and routine maintenance is not ignored. Routine inspection and thoroughly examination is there. Now we also have sometimes the conveyors, some hazards are there, drawing and hazards at the running nip points, entanglement with rotating parts and also falling objects, especially from overhead conveyors. These are some of the, some of the precautions for conveyors. That means alarms to warn of the start of movement, guards on moving parts, emergency stops. So all these things mostly comes in the design. So make sure you are incorporating all the precautions or the standards in the, in the design phase. If an equipment is poorly designed, more hazards. So safety starts from the design. It is very much important what kind of design you are buying in shape of conveyors. It's very important what kind of forklift, even battery operated, how you are making sure what kind of safety features are incorporated, how it is sensorized, so nothing will go wrong. How the forklift operator, can, can you find any forklift operator if uh, safety belt is not buckling up, the forklift will not be move on, you know, you can't move it. If any backup warning or horns are not working, you can't move on. I mean, that means the biggest room in the world is the room for further improvement. So basically the technology, the innovation, the creativity should bring the solutions, even intentional human errors can also be avoided here. I repeat, we have two types of human errors. One is unintentional. They don't want to do any mistake, but it's happened, it's a human error. It's kind of a nature also, but the terrible phenomena mostly industries are facing because a lot of suicide attempts are noticed in the industries, especially in developing countries. So that is intentional, you know. So how are you going to protect that even intentional human error is also avoidable? Or you have innovation or creativity or kind of solutions against unintentional human errors also or intentional human errors as well. So it's, it's entirely game of designing. That means you should invest, put more time and energy in design phase. Once the building is constructed and the design is poorly designed building, so what safety we are talking about? Already a lot of hazards we welcome because we ignore a lot of uh, safety standards in the design phase. And let me be more straightforward here. 90%, 90% you can ensure safety in design phase. I repeat again, 90% safety requirements if you are incorporating, that means 90% safety of your employees, property, and this all can be skewed if you are putting more time and energy and innovation and creativity in the design phase, that you are not ignoring any kind of safety regulations in the design phase. I mean, you go back and see the BOQ, we call it bill of quantity of any of your project, any of your building, okay, your office building, Go back and ask someone, especially from the finance department or finance manager, tell him or to procurement manager, you know, tell him, show me the BOQ of our building, the bill of quantity and see how many list of items are listed there and which item is purchased as per international standards and which standard and how they ensured it, you know. And then have some verification of your, you know, incoming inspection records and see 
how they ensured that those items were purchased as per international standards. And even you can talk to the consultant of that project when the building was being constructed, he would have all the stories. I hope you got the point. So this BOQ document of any project or bill of quantity we call it, will give you a complete insight which item is purchased as per which international standards, either your electrical cables, either your iron steel, whatever, even the door material, even your cement, everything you know relevant to your building. Based on which international standard they are purchased and how they verified that the supplier or the contractor, they didn't play with you or there isn't any violation, you know. So if you are incorporating safety requirements in the design phase, 90% your safety requirements are compliant. And now you just need to ensure rest of the 10% to maintain, to make sure not because of human error, not because of your poor system implementation, something could, or more probability of accident could happen. You know. So I hope it will give you an idea. Whatever we are buying, the forklift we are purchasing, review the design. You are buying a crane, review the design and let the supplier, you know, give the answer of your a lot of technical questions. You know, don't accept blindly, oh, he's a big brand, he's a global brand. Still, that brand could get some suggestions from you for further improvement. Or might be you are not satisfied with their design engineering standards, you know. Might be you can suggest something more productive. But if you will not review their design or kind of specs or, or the safety features especially, they incorporated like safety sensors, safety de devices, the guarding, a lot of, you know, might be some other safety sensor or some kind of alarms, you know, they incorporated within that equipment. The moment you will start reviewing the design of those equipment, you will get plenty of new suggestions and maybe new ideas coming in your mind and that ideas you can share with the, and also you can sell up these ideas uh, to be very honest. Because sometimes your idea is a multi-million dollar idea. So you can, if you are much creative, mashallah. That is why a lot of importance is being given to the design engineers. And another importance is being given to the reliability engineers not to the maintenance technicians or maintenance team, the reliability engineers who can lead to those maintenance teams and understand the variables or any maintenance factor, how it can be drastically horrible because the, the reliability engineer or the design engineer, they can tell what can go wrong. If we will change that part, what would be the impact of uh, other parts of the machine? You know? like bringing new part inside one equipment, how it could be affecting to the other parts, which are the, also the oldest one. So how that combination or kind of variables could be there. I hope uh, it will help you to give some insights because sometimes we believe, oh, it's a brand, it's a big brand, it's a global brand. So we don't need to ask them any technical questions. So no harm to create some questions for them also. Now I'm opening one question for all of you. What could go wrong with a mobile crane during its operation? Try to explain why. What could go wrong with a mobile crane during its operation? And why? Waiting for your answer, just few more minutes, then you will move on for lunch or prayer break. So let's wrap up this group exercise with a better energy, inshallah. What could go wrong with a mobile crane during its operation? Excellent, Mr. Ahmed, mashallah. You know, one of the terrible environmental aspects, and of course, have terrible impacts like the wind speed. You know, let me share with all of you. I was in a meeting in a company and uh, after having some five, 10 minutes tea break, we came out 
in the hall, you know, not in the rooms. And this hall is associated with two doors, glass doors, I would say. And there was a wind uh, outside, not so much terrible, but one door was broken immediately and the rest of the doors are okay. And now they all started asking me, Ishtiak, what happened? What is the logic behind? Why all doors are not broken? Because sometimes it happens, especially in Saudi Arabia, the velocity of uh, wind is not similar everywhere. It's not same everywhere. Because the speed and velocity of, uh, you know, of that wind and hit to that glass, that more impact, more speed and, you know, that's why only that glass door is uh, broken up actually because of the terrible velocity and wind speed and impacted on only or faced by only that glass door. That is why it's broken up immediately. But the rest of the doors, they didn't face that much speed and that much velocity of wind. That is why they are still safe. And it was a game of seconds, you know, we all shocked. We are shocked within seconds, how come a glass door, you know? That means this glass door was not designed or made it resistible of that level of velocity or the wind speed. Same way, if we are operating a crane and wind speed is above than 32 kilometer per hour, or even more than that, more chances of tipping over, toppling over, more chances of property damage, more chances of uh, incident or turning over or tipping over, you know, of this crane. Even though the outer riggers are there, even though the crane capacity is okay. Yes, Mr. Raymond, you're absolutely right. Unproper lifting plan can also lead, you know, that is why whenever we are lifting 40 tons or above, we always uh, are bound to have rigor level one. And that is why we are paying him more, you know. Because he is responsible to prepare and approve critical lift plan. Yes, wrong calculation of the load and angle, of course, it will also would be a terrible reason and also not achieving center of gravity and several kind of uh, structural or collapse because kind of mechanical hydraulic pneumatic energies are there. Excellent machine. Now let's see what Nibosh is talking about. These are some of the hazards related to cranes like crane collapsing or toppling over, the arm or boom jeep striking structures, falling load, the load striking objects of people, contact with live overhead cables, Now, what are the factors uh, causing instability, overloading, uneven or unstable ground, not using outer riggers correctly, or use in high winds or extending the jib or the boom too far, and structural failure, like mentioned by Mr. Ahmed as well. These are some of the factors causing instability. So now, what are the general requirements of safe lifting operations? First of all, make sure you have understanding for the suitable for the task and appropriate rated, equipment stable and secure and visible marked and safe working load. And whenever we have third party inspection of heavy equipment, the most important factor, what new safe working load they have mentioned after detailed analysis or kind of inspection, that is pretty important for us. You know? And every year, the shelf life or depreciation is being done of that equipment. So uh, if the new crane is there and it can lift like 200 tons, does not mean that after one year or two years or three years or four years, it is going to have the same capacity. No, no, no. Every year, it is being depreciated. 
that is why we conduct uh, third party inspection companies to come and you know uh, tell us the safe working load and lifting operations planned carried on and supervised by competent person equipment for lifting persons may require additional inspections some more requirements planning and preparing the lift means risk assessment by competent person is uh, critically important and check crane test records trained operators certified qualified competent operators crew correct type for the job and terrain and also load within safe lifting capacity so we are not violating the capacity of the crane few more uh, requirements for the safe lifting operations uh, carrying out the lift make sure careful setting use outer rigger correctly plan and supervise lifts banksman signaler that means the you know the signal man we required overload indicators work check weather conditions use pps warning signs attach link carefully carry out attach lift and guide using tag line these are some of the precautions and of course uh, i'm i'm very much uh, hopeful that you guys are already understand and you are implementing all these uh, you know uh, safe practice for lifting operations but still this kind of a refresh of your vocabulary inshallah yes you know uh, excellent mr ayman you highlighted this point you know if if i have a chemical issue or some kind of chemical hazards there is no harm as a safety officer to talk to the chemical engineers of my company and they would suggest for surely the right set of uh, solutions or precautions or controls against these chemical hazards if i have an issue for electrical or some electrical hazards are there no harm to talk to the specialized electrical engineers and they might give me more technical you know or more better solutions against those electrical hazards so i totally agree you know if i have some excavation hazards or kind of uh, hazards associated with my you know uh, different processes related to the confined spaces especially the excavated one deeper than 4 feet no harm to talk to the civil engineers so they would suggest maybe some better solutions instead of me as a safety officer trying to impose or suggesting all solutions and then later on the engineers are the relevant engineers they are cross checking or cross questioning and putting me in trouble that is why the team work is important we as a safety officer or kind of safety leader we are facilitating and bringing the all minds in one safe direction to avoid any kind of incident or accident but that coordination if it is missing less would be the trust also and no trust means more probability of again you know unsafe facts unsafe conditions or even more chances of injuries or accidents now these uh, are some of the requirements for uh, lifting equipment how to examine examine them like examples is eu uk lifting operations and lifting equipment regulations 1998 lawler we call it lifting operations and lifting equipment regulations 1998 uh during the break time i'll try to download that uh, regulations and will or maybe i find out the link and will share in the group also inshallah uh third example uh, examination before it is used for the first time periodically after an event that may have affected what strength and stability frequency every 12 months we are not used to carry people every 6 months we are used to carry people and every 6 months lifting accessories by a competent engineer so these are Uh, some of the key points of this lifting operations and lifting equipment regulations 1998 so what are the potential hazards arising from the use of manual pallet truck to move a heavy load now i hope you have clear understanding what can go wrong so that is all about the summary of this element like uh, define ergonomic and msds uh, we discuss about dsc also we also discuss about the kind of injuries especially msds and rules 
and most importantly the main factors relevant to task individual load and environment so inshallah after the break we will uh, uh, we will start our element seven like chemical and biological agents and especially we'll take example of coronavirus because that is the biological hazard the live examples and we'll start it after the break inshallah okay thank you very much for your patience for your energy for listening for participating and learning mashallah Okay, so have a nice break, prayer, prayer and lunch break and come back at 1 inshallah.